Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dr. Henry Adams, the Ruth Coulter Heady Professor of Art History at Case Western Reserve, and I'm extremely pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Del Banco, recipient of the 2019 Annisfeld Wolf Book Award in Nonfiction. The Annisfeld Wolf Book Awards were established in 1935 by Cleveland poet and philanthropist Edith Annisfeld Wolf. The awards recognize books that have made important contributions to our understanding of racism and bigotry and our appreciation of the rich diversity of human cultures. The list of past and present winners is quite an amazing one and includes many of the greatest writers American writers of the 20th century. The Cleveland Foundation, the world's first community foundation, has administered the award since 1963. And for the past few years, the City Club has been proud to partner with the foundation to provide a forum for winners of these distinguished awards. I've been a friend and admirer of Andy's work for a number of years and got to know him in an unusual way through my friendship with the great scholar of Chinese painting, Wai Kam Ho, the father of Dawn, his wife. Uh, Wai Kam was my colleague when I was curator at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City and was formerly curator of Chinese art at Cleveland. Wycombe combined the training of a traditional Chinese scholar with the complete mastery of the principles of Western art history. And through his knowledge of Chinese literature and poetry, could come up with insights that had eluded other scholars for generations. I remember looking at a great Song Dynasty landscape with him in Kansas City and reading the label aloud. Oh no, that's not it at all, Wycombe said. This is the fisherman at the end of the day, and it's based on the poem by Su Tung Po. And then he added rather sadly, when I was younger, I knew the whole poem. Now I can only remember the first 40 lines. <laughs> I might add that Wycombe was a compulsive book lover and book collector. His books overflowed everywhere, and his wife, uh, Wai Cheng, had to battle to keep him from storing them in the kitchen cabinets or even in the oven. Wycombe was immensely proud of Andy and proud that he possessed the two traits of a great scholar, accuracy and imagination. I've read most of Andy's books, which are masterful, but I think The War Before the War is the masterpiece of his work to date. It's a book that brings to light near forgotten stories of fugitive slaves and brings them to the forefront of American history. It's also a book that makes us see seemingly familiar ways in a new way, seemingly familiar things in a new way, often in frightening ways, for example, in the revelation that the defense of slavery was embedded in distinctly evasible, evasive but unmistakable language in Article IV of the American Constitution. In the best sense, this is a troubling book which forces us uh, to think about American history uh, from new angles and implicitly asks us what each of us can do today to battle social injustice. Uh, Andy, um, <clears throat> well, the book has been named the New York Times Critics Best Book of 2018. It was winner of the 44th Annual Lionel Trilling Book Award and was also a recipient of the 2019 Lucas Prize by the Columbia Journal School. Journal, uh, journalism School. A graduate of Harvard, uh, 
Andy Delbanco is now Alexander Hamilton Professor of American Studies at Columbia, where he has taught for the past 30 years. He was recently appointed president of the Teagle Foundation, which supports liberal education for college students of all backgrounds. Dr. Delbanco was named America's Best Social Critic by Time Magazine in 2001 and was presented with the National Humanities Medal by Barack Obama in 2012 for his writings on higher education and on the place of classic authors uh, in history and contemporary life. Let me just say one more thing, a personal one. It's a great honor for me today to play a small role in the Ennisfeld Book Award. I think it's no uh, secret that we're going through a troubling uh, time today. At the same time, it seems to me that in many ways we're at a cultural tipping point where it's become natural for many of us uh, to work both at home uh, and at work uh, with people from diverse cultures. African Americans have contributed in positive and extraordinary ways to every aspect of American life. And I think it's uh, nice to, a great honor to uh, play a small role in celebrating that. Guest members and friends of the City Club, uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Andrew Del Banco. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, I'm wearing a mic. Is that projecting my voice adequately? That's right. Uh, I'm actually very touched by those words. Uh, why come my father-in-law was someone I not only admired but was felt very, very close to. So it's wonderful to be reminded of him and to be here in Cleveland. Um, I try to say one or two lighthearted things when I give a talk. That's a challenge on this topic. Uh, but I think Dan gave me an opening when he mentioned that uh, I will be signing books afterwards, which of course authors like to do. Um, puts me in mind of an occasion in New York about 15 years ago when my book on Herman Melville came out and there was a line of folks and they said, oh, well, please sign this. I'm going to treasure this. It's going to become part of my family heritage. And the next day I saw it on eBay. Uh, <laughs> at a at an ambitious price point of, I think, $62. I'm sure nobody ever bought it. But anyway, I'm sure that won't happen here in the great city of, of, of Cleveland. Um, now, it's been a very busy and intense and stimulating couple of days uh, for me here. I, I had the pleasure yesterday of speaking to a group of high school students up in Shaker Heights, which was very invigorating, giving, giving me and us, I think, hope for, for the future. Um, and what, one thing that has struck me is that a number of people at last night's ceremony and also up in Shaker Heights, people of a certain age, say around my generation or maybe a little younger, would say, you know, when I studied the Civil War in school, we were sort of told that it wasn't about slavery. It was about a cultural clash between North and South. Or it was about two different economic systems, you know, an agricultural economy, an industrial economy, and so on. Now, I'm afraid that's actually true. That is, it's not, those statements are not true, but it's true that for a very long time, the teaching of American history made a point of evading, if not erasing, the reality of slavery. One thing you can conclude from that is that those teachers had never read Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address in which he said, everyone knows that slavery was somehow the cause of the war. Everyone knew it then, but it somehow got erased. Now, one of the promising things I think about our own cultural moment is that we're not deceiving ourselves about this anymore, at least not to the extent that we once did. There's a raft of books, many published every year, on one aspect or another of the horrors of slavery. Uh, and as my Columbia colleague Eric Foner has put it, we now understand, the economic historians have helped us to understand, that the value of human property, that very concept, is something that's difficult to wrap around the mind, but it was a conventional concept in 18th and 19th century America. The value of human property at the time of the Civil War exceeded the value of all the banks, factories, and railroads combined. 
which helps to explain in a dark way why slave owners were willing to fight to keep that property because it represented not just their livelihood but their whole sense of themselves and the bedrock of their culture. Now, one might reasonably ask, and I think every writer ought to ask him or herself, in the face of so much scholarship and so many books, why write another one? Who needs another one? My best answer to that is that I felt, uh, and I was a little surprised to discover this, that there's an aspect of the slavery story, namely the story of human beings, enslaved human beings, who had the courage and were willing to take the risk of actually fleeing to freedom in the face of all kinds of odds and dark consequences for themselves if they were caught or their families. Uh, that that story, although we have many monographs, many studies of individual fugitive slaves and many memoirs by fugitive slaves, most famously Frederick Douglass, who has been much in the public conversation recently, there wasn't a book, it seemed to me, that tried to tell the larger story of how the collective effort of enslaved people to emancipate themselves had made such a deep mark on our history and indeed had contributed, in my view, very uh, importantly to the coming of the Civil War. So I, wanted, I decided I wanted to try to tell that story. The second question a writer, I think, ought to ask him or herself when undertaking any story is, where should the story begin? That makes a difference. <clears throat> Turns out the story of enslaved human beings running for freedom could begin almost at the beginning of recorded human history because of the simple fact that human beings, and this I think is a trans-historical fact, it's always been true, human beings do not wish to be enslaved. It might seem so obvious as to not need stating, but we want to remind ourselves that in the 18th and 19th centuries in our country, Slave owners made the argument with sincere conviction that slavery was not only good for them, for the owners, but it was also good for the slaves. An argument that I hope by now sounds preposterous in our ears, but which required a refutation at the time. The person who refuted it most brilliantly and briefly, I think, was Abraham Lincoln. He said at one point, he said, you know, I'm told, and I'm paraphrasing, which is a sin with Lincoln, I'm told that uh, slavery is a, is a good thing. It's a very strange kind of goodness that no man ever wishes for himself. In fact, show me the, show me the first white man who volunteers to become a slave after giving a long speech about how great it is to be a slave. I think you'd have to wait a long time for that person to step forward. So I could have begun this story almost anywhere. And I could, I could have begun it, for instance, in the 15th or 16th century when the European slave traders arrived on the west coast of Africa to seize forcefully human beings from their families and their homes, put them on ships and ship them to the New World. But by the time that process was concluded, nearly 12 million human beings were shipped from Africa to the New World, about half a million of whom ended up here in what became the United States. Those slave traders understood pretty quickly that they had to deal with the problem that people didn't want to be enslaved. So they invented such devices as iron neck halters that would be placed around the necks of captives with spikes coming out of them so that anyone who tried to escape back inland by making their way through the bramble, the underbrush, would get caught uh, on the bushes and would be stopped uh, on the effort to uh, uh, get it inland and away, away from the coast. The founders of our republic knew all this. They knew that involuntary servitude was in fact involuntary. They also knew when they came to Philadelphia in 1787 that in effect they were there for the project of trying to create one nation out of two. Now, 
politically and legally. We could have a debate about that statement. But what I mean by that is that they understood that in the southern colonies, now states, slavery, this involuntary and inhuman institution, was fundamental. It was the bedrock of the culture, the economy, the very way of life. In the northern colonies, not necessarily because northern whites were more enlightened in all respects, but for <coughs> historical, climatological, geographical reasons, slavery was already on the road to extinction. It was pretty clear if you looked at the United States in the 1780s that slavery had not much of a future in the northern states and it was deeply entrenched in the southern states. So how were they going to make one country out of these two countries in which, as James Madison, one of the architects of the Constitution put it, the laws of the several states were uncharitable to one another, by which he meant in some states servitude was legal, in others it wasn't. This raised an immediate political, legal, conceptual problem, you might call it. I don't mean to abstract it beyond the real human content of the problem. What would be the status of a human being who was enslaved, say, in South Carolina or Georgia or Virginia, who fled to freedom in Massachusetts or Connecticut? What would the status of that person be? Would that be a free person by the laws of the state to which he had fled, or an enslaved person by the laws of the state from which he had fled? The founders tried to deal with this problem by introducing into the Constitution what I might call a kind of intranational extradition treaty. They put a clause into the Constitution, Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, to which Henry alluded, in which they wrote, and these are words that we don't often inscribe on the granite when we celebrate the virtues of our Constitution. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall be discharged from such service or labor but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Now, to be fair, Henry said I have a tendency to accuracy. I'm not sure that's true, but to try to be accurate, the clause did not refer only to enslaved African Americans. It also uh, referred to indentured white servants and people accused of crimes. But, it, but at the core of it, at the center of it, the motivation behind it was to try to address this problem of fugitive slaves. And uh, when one of the representatives from South Carolina, Charles Pinckney, went back to Charleston, remember the Constitution had to be ratified by the several states before it would take effect, he explained to his fellow citizens who were dubious about you know, giving too much power to this new federal government, he explained to them, look, our, sec the, our security in our slave property will be greater with this Constitution, with this clause, than without it. I'm inclined to pause for a moment to reflect on the fact that, because I think it gives us a window into the dark continuities of American history, you will recall that four years ago in Charleston, South Carolina, the Reverend Clementa Pinckney was murdered in his church by a deranged white supremacist. Very likely, the Reverend Pinckney was a descendant of slaves owned by this same Charles Pinckney whom I just quoted, and quite possibly a descendant of Charles Pinckney himself. Because as we know, one of the ways in which slave owners exploited their slaves was to use them for their own sexual satisfaction. Turns out that Mr. Pinckney spoke too soon. The clause in the Constitution proved to be unenforceable. If you've listened carefully to it, you'll notice it's placed in this sort of passive language, shall be delivered up. If you're an English teacher and you get a paper with that phrase on it, you're, you're likely to mark it up and say, could you, be, could you clarify uh, who is actually going to do the delivering up here? 
and the, and the truth is, the founders had no idea. They didn't know how to answer that question. Was it going to be the local police department in Waltham, Massachusetts? There weren't really any police departments. Was it going to be the state militia? Or was it going to be officers of the federal government, which, was barely, which barely existed and had none of the enforcement authority, and one has, it's irresistible to consider the, a certain parallel to one of the hot button issues of our day, the enforcement of immigration laws. The federal government had no ICE, no immigration enforcement division. It had no standing army. It had no national guard. So who was going to enforce uh, uh, this, this, this law? As the 19th century proceeded over the course of the first half of the 19th century, the unenforceability of this clause became more and more clear. Why? Among other reasons, because the border of, the, of these two countries between the North and the South became longer and more porous as the nation expanded westward. It wasn't any longer only a question of slaves seeking freedom by fleeing from Maryland or Virginia across the border into Pennsylvania. Now it was also from Kentucky into this state of Ohio or from Missouri into Illinois. It became uh, a large border uh, control problem to use uh, today's border security problem today to use today's uh, language. Moreover, some of the northern states, beginning with Pennsylvania, passed what became known as personal liberty laws, deliberately designed to make it as difficult as possible for southern whites to recover their uh, absconded, to use the language of the day slave property. It's an old legal strategy. If you want to discourage somebody from pursuing a case, tie them up in court. Make it expensive. Make it necessary for them to bring multiple witnesses to prove that this escaped slave actually once belonged to you. And Pennsylvania was pretty successful in doing that. In fact, they began with a law in 1780 declaring that any a uh, southerner who brought a slave with him into the state of Pennsylvania, if that slave was in residence for more than six months, he or she would be declared free. One of the early vigilance committees that were looking out for the interests of enslaved people knocked on the door in Philadelphia of, one of the, another South Carolinian guy named Pierce Butler who is also a representative at the Constitutional Convention, and said, you know, we've been watching you for a while. It's come to our attention that your slave, his name was Ben, has been living with you for more than six months, so he's now a free man. To which Mr. Butler replied, I'm a citizen of South Carolina. What have the laws of Pennsylvania to do with me? Which is an exchange that crystallizes for us, I think, this problem of federal authority versus state authority, state autonomy, states' rights, and so on, issues that are still very much with us today. We're watching the federal government at, le at legal loggerheads with the state of California order over auto emissions, for example. So these, these questions have not been put to rest, though they uh, involve, involve different issues. As the century went on, southern whites accused northern whites of enticing their human property to come across the border with false promises of a better life in the, in the north. Northern whites accused southern whites of sending kidnappers across the border who would take back not only accused fugitives, but any able-bodied black man or attractive black woman whom they thought they could get a good price for on the slave market back down south. Some of the fugitives who made it across the border in these dark times, notably Frederick Douglass, began to tell their own stories, began to tell their stories in public meetings like this, sponsored by abolitionist societies, began to publish their own stories. Douglass famously published his autobiography in 1845. On the principle, I think, I found myself thinking this as I wrote the book, the same principle that led Dr. King uh, to strategize during the civil rights movement of the 1950s. Show the public what this really is, and they will be revolted. And a public sentiment will rise against us, against slavery. Just as Dr. King knew, it's not that he wanted to put children in front of police dogs or, or young 
young men in front of fire hoses because they wanted to have the right to eat a hamburger at, a, at an integrated lunch counter, but because he believed that if Americans actually saw these images, their outrage and indignation would be ignited. And I think the abolitionist movement in the 1830s and 40s was quite successful in this regard. So the fugitive slaves in that sense already made a tremendous contribution to the anti-slavery movement. So then in 1850, and I'm compressing for, for reasons of time, in 1850, the Congress faced a, a difficult moment when after the Mexican War, various issues had to be uh, adjudicated between North and South, and they drafted what became known as the Compromise of 1850. At the heart of that compromise, Southerners said, okay, the time has now come. We need a real serious law with teeth in it that will make real that toothless clause in the Constitution that we've been unable to enforce. This was the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. It was a law without mercy. It denied the right to trial by jury to the accused fugitive. It denied the right of habeas corpus. It made it a federal crime for any citizen to aid or abet a fugitive slave. It created a whole new category of federal commissioners who were empowered in essentially secret hearings to decide whether the fugitive was or was not the person that the owner claimed and to send that person back down south without anything resembling due process. There was a, a late professor at my university who coined a phrase called the law of unintended consequences. If there was ever a law of unintended consequences, it was the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 because it was designed, it was intended, the supporters of it on both sides hoped that it would hold the country together. But in fact, it had exactly the opposite effect. It drove the two sections apart. Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, leading intellectual of the North, arguably, said it came like a sheet of lightning at midnight. And if you interrogate his metaphor a little bit, you want to ask, so what, what did it illuminate? What it illuminated was the fact that Northerners had been deceiving themselves, Northern whites had been deceiving themselves, fooling themselves into believing that slavery was somehow somebody else's problem. That by virtue of the fact that I live in a free state, I got nothing to do with the problem. I might feel bad about it, but it's not my problem. This, of course, was never true. How could it be true if for anyone who walked around with cotton clothing on their backs or benefited from the Industrial Revolution that came to New England with the textile mills that were spinning slave-grown cotton into cloth for the for the export trade or put their money in the State Street banks or the Wall Street banks that then loaned that money to the southern plantation owners. Everybody was up to their eyeballs in slavery. Every American was complicit in slavery. That's why Mr. Lincoln in that great second inaugural address doesn't speak of southern slavery. He speaks of American slavery. But most northern whites had done a good job of deceiving themselves that this was not their problem. 1850 made it harder to do that. Again, quoting Emerson, he said, when my New England neighbors enjoy their pastries or cakes or put sugar in their, in their tea, no one tasted blood in the treats. After 1850, you couldn't avoid the taste. Why? Because now the slave was not somebody down in South Carolina or Georgia whom you might read about in a magazine but the fugitive slave was somebody who had been your neighbor for, for months or maybe even years who had a tailor shop or a barber shop and whom a, a, a mob, not a lawless mob, but a duly uh, assigned by the federal government with authority law enforcement mob would grab that person off the streets of Boston or Syracuse or Buffalo and take him to the, take him to the pier, put him on a boat and send him back to the hell from which he came. The Fugitive Slave Law, in short, radicalized the North. One of the conservative business people, one of the industrialists of New England, said in 1854, after one particularly noxious fugitive slave case, the case of Anthony Burns, 
said, we went to bed last night as conservative unionists and we woke up as stark mad abolitionists. It was one of those turning point events. And Dan and others have alluded to the fact that we stand possibly right now at a turning point in the history of the Republic. I don't mean to make facile analogies, but when you read about turning point events, one of the things you realize is that things can change very quickly. And public sentiment can change very quickly. The other thing, maybe sort of more or less the last thing I want to say before we open up for questions, I don't know about answers, just questions, uh, is that I found myself thinking of that remark that Mark Twain is said to have made, probably didn't make it, but it's a good remark anyway. History does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. This book is a rhyming story. You'll read in this book, as I hope you will read this book, about how any black man who was running or even walking fast in antebellum America was assumed to be a criminal. And the crime of which he was charged, with which he was charged, was the crime of stealing himself. You'll read, particularly with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, about how uh, African Americans, including those who had never been enslaved, legally free African Americans living in the North, were afraid to go out on the street, and the sight of any law enforcement officer was terrifying because of their vulnerability under that law. You could say, they didn't use this terminology, but you could say that some of the cities of the North, Boston, Rochester, Syracuse, among others, essentially declared themselves to be sanctuary cities. And one of the other interesting rhymes I found was that, you know, Southerners uh, who had been big advocates of states' rights, right? We associate rightly in the 19th century, it was really John C. Calhoun of South Carolina who invented the concept, but all the way through George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door and saying, get the federal marshals out of here and leave Alabama to Alabamians. States' rights has been the clarion call of racists, not to put too fine a point on it. All of a sudden, with the passage of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, Southern whites became big fans of the federal government. You know, send the federal troops up to Boston and teach them a lesson because they're disobeying this law. And by the same token, New Englanders, who had been by and large pretty big fans of a centralized uh, a federal, federal authority, became states' writers. They said, you know, Massachusetts makes its own laws as to who is free and who is enslaved, and the federal government has no business sending marshals or anybody else to Boston uh, to tell us uh, how to live. I said that would be the last thing. I want to say one other last thing. I never tell the truth when I say it's going to be the last thing. In some respects, this is a story where the moral clarities are pretty un unmistakable. There is no moral ambiguity about the evil of slavery. And one of the astonishing things I found myself dealing with was the question of how is it that people of such profound intelligence as the founders of our republic could have failed to see what seems so clear to us as a matter of right and wrong. At the same time, I've tried to bring out in this book, and this might be one of its more distinctive features, that there were people of good conscience who hated slavery, who nevertheless concluded that they had to support that odious law. That included Abraham Lincoln. He didn't support it with any enthusiasm, but who reluctantly acquiesced to it and wrote to a friend in 1855, I hate to see the poor creatures hunted down and returned to their stripes, but I bite my lip and keep quiet. Why? Because he, like Daniel Webster and other, what we would call now moderate anti-slavery people, believed that without that law, the nation would have come apart in 1850, the South would have seceded and could well have gone on to become a slave-based empire spreading into the Caribbean, spreading deeper into Mexico, 
I'm not saying they were right or they were wrong. What I am saying is that by the study of history, I think we should come away with a sense of how hard it is to know what's going to happen. Something which it might be useful to remind ourselves. None of these people knew what was going to happen. None of them knew that the nation would stay together for another decade, a civil war would come, a million young men and boys would die, and before the war was over, the institution of slavery would be destroyed. None of them saw that coming. And I guess I want to suggest, and this really is in closing, that before judging all these historical actors for failing to do the right thing, we might want to ask some hard questions about ourselves. How pure and free of complicity are we in the evils of our own time? How sure are we about what's the right thing to do in the face of the crises that we face in our own time, as which, as bad as they may seem, bear no comparison to the struggle over slavery in our history. Thank you very much. That's Andy Del Banco. You are done? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> well done. I'm well, well I'm done. Well done. <laughs> I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club. Today we're hearing from Dr. Andrew Del Banco, recipient of the 2019 Annisfield Wolf Book Award in nonfiction. He's the author of The War Before the War, Fugitive Slaves, and the Struggle for America's Soul from the Revolution to the Civil War. We're about to begin the Q&A with the audience, all of you. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast with, on WCPN or our live stream, including students from the Mandel Humanities Center at Cuyahoga Community College. If you'd like to tweet a question, just tweet it at the City Club and our team will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today, our content coordinator, Bliss Davis, and City Club intern, Remy Orasanya. May we have our first question, please? Yes, sir. Uh, you talk about rhyming. Uh, I couldn't think, help but think as you talked about a lot of what's going on now today concerning ice mirrors, to a certain extent, what going, was going on back then. Could you comment on that, please? Well, you know, I appreciate the question. In a sense, I invited the question by saying, by saying that uh, there are some rhymes in this book. At the same time, I, I don't like to present myself as an authority uh, on the difficult issues of the present. Uh, and I don't want to take us off into a discussion about what's the right policy on, on immigration. I think uh, we can all agree that the cruelties perpetrated on so-called undocumented immigrants are uh, deeply at odds with our sense of who we should be as a people. Uh, at the same time, I think it is true that nations have to have borders. So to me, the sad takeaway from the present situation is that our legislature and our political process has failed to come up with a reasonable way of doing justice to the children of, of folks who came here without papers, doing justice to the desperate people who are fleeing from terrible circumstances and Central and South America, and in that sense, they are in some ways analogous to the fugitives from slavery whom I've been talking about. And at the same time, developing a rational immigration policy that I think reasonable people on both sides of the question ought to agree that we need. So it's one of the failures of our political system that we're in the situation that we are now and seeing such tragic human, human cost. If we accept, as I do, that the compromise baked into the Constitution was a historical necessity, it's kind of basic to remember that Virginia, George Washington's home, slaveholding state, kind of core of the new union. If we accept that, and then we look forward to the Civil War, do you, as a student of that period, see any missed opportunity to avoid the Civil War? Well, this is one of the classic questions of American historiography. Was, was the Civil War inevitable? 
or was it avertible? And it's again, it's a, it's a question on which I'm, I'm going to be evasive because it, it takes us into the territory of what if. And I've, although that's a very tempting and interesting place to go, it's generally, I think, territory for novelists. Philip Roth, for instance, a book I just recently reread, a very chilling book, The Plot Against America, in which he imagines that Charles Lindbergh is elected president of the United States in 1940, and the United States becomes a, a, a Nazi sympathizing power. It's a great book to read, but it's, an, it's, it's a work of the imagination. I, I, I lean toward the inevitable school. I lean toward the view that because of the tremendous economic stakes for the slave-owning states, a voluntary relinquishment of slavery was never in the cards. Well, there were many people, Henry Clay, for instance, the architect of the Compromise of 1850, believed all his life that voluntary emancipation would someday address the problem. So, you know, historians used to have a rough consensus that slavery was kind of withering away on its own, and if more time had been allowed, it would have died on the vine. Today, historians have moved to a different view that slavery was actually in an expansive mode and that the only way to deal with it was a violent frontal assault. So that's the best I can do with that question. Uh, as I say, my effort in this book is to try to write with some sympathy about people who are wrestling with that very question. Should we try to postpone this bloody conflict in the hopes that it won't be needed? Or should we face the necessity to have it and to have it now? And I would only say, if I may, one other thing about that. I'm struck, you know, many academic historians love the Civil War. And they love it, I mean, that's putting it a little grossly, but they, they, they approve of it because it came out the right way. And it, and it brought about the right result. Nobody in 1861, much less in 1850, could have known that. And in fact, for the first two years of the war, it looked very bad for the cause of the North. It looked quite possible that the North would actually lose the war or would have to settle it on, with an armistice that left slavery in place. So when you start a war, I mean, it was, of course, the South Carolinians who started it, but when you accept a war, go into a war, one thing we've learned, haven't we, from Iran, I mean, Iraq, that was a slip of the tongue, which I hope won't prove prescient, uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan, we have no idea what happens once the shooting starts. So we can say very easily, in retrospect, the people who pushed for the war were right, the people who hesitated and feared it and and didn't want to see it happen were wrong, that's easy in retrospect. That's the best I can do with that question. Deborah, yeah. A follow-up uh, on that question. Well, need a mic. Need a mic. I guess, I guess uh, I'm not in charge of the mic, so we'll have, but we'll get to you, right? I believe that the opening volley of the Civil War is actually fired by Congress in 1787 with the adoption of the Northwest Ordinance, which declared it a free territories and the states admitted, i.e. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota would be forever free. And I believe that that made the question of a civil war, not an if, but a when. It's a perfectly respectable proposition that, uh, as Mr. Lincoln said, a nation half free and half slave cannot stand. And, it, and the nation was constructed as such almost from the beginning. So it's a respectable argument. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Thanks, thanks for the discussion. Um, you talked a little bit about the impact for the state and the, the elected officials of the North trying to come up with some sort of enforcement thing. But I thought in reading your book, I thought one of the most fascinating parts was the individual decisions that had to be made, that they were somehow drafted 
the Northerners who were resisting were somehow drafted into an, the enforcement plan of the Southern economy, and almost dragooned. I would, you know, is a way I it would I would almost look at it. So I wonder how was that personal challenge um, addressed in like the gro the broad scale? Do we have, you know, everybody kind of second guessing themselves at this point? Well, look, you know. Uh I want to be careful about all the presentist analogies and, and, and to say, again, that frankly, any analogy with slavery or the slavery issue is inadequate and off base because it's an unprecedented and unparalleled issue in the history of our country. Nevertheless, with that qualification stated, we've been watching on television the last few days People of, I think people of conscience struggling with how to reconcile what they believe themselves to be right and what the law appears to require them to do. I'll go out on a limb and say I was actually quite sympathetic to the acting director of national intelligence yesterday. I'm not saying he made the right call when he consulted the White House counsel and the uh, uh, Department of Justice on what to do when he got that whistle, whistleblower's report. I don't know if he made the right call, but I think he was genuinely wrestling with his own conscience about what was the right thing to do. And you see in this period, and I think, I hope that's one of the aspects that gives some force to the book, decent people struggling with this question of, as you say, what to do when the law requires them to do the dirty work of southern slave owners. A guy in Boston named Charles Devins, for instance, who had, was, felt he was required to participate in the remanding of a fugitive slave named Thomas Sims, did what he thought was his duty, and then spent years trying to find a way to buy freedom for the very man whom he had sent back to slavery. So, again, it, it, we can decide they made the right call, they made the wrong call. In our own lives, we look back at our personal decisions, our family decisions, and say, you know, if only I'd gone that way 25 years ago, then things might have gone differently, and why did I make such a dumb decision? It's hard to return ourselves to the position of not being able to calculate the consequences of our actions. And that's part of the mystery and I think fascination of writing, writing about the past. And I, I try to write respectfully of, of, of that mystery. Professor, this is a question about economics. Good, then I, I almost certainly won't be able to answer it. I, right. I, <laughs> I understand that there were some powerful, pivotal moments for individuals and for groups of individuals in the North, but we are learning more every day about the importance of the Southern economy to the Northern economy. Right. And so my question is, how did those who cared about the success of the North, the economic success of the North, get comfortable with the notion of going to war when that portion of the economy that relied on slaves and the productivity of slaves would be threatened thereby? The short answer is that a lot of them never did get comfortable with the concept of going to, the, to war. A slightly less short answer is that with all the reluctance and the prudence that you're implying, you know, this will be disruptive to the economic life, not just of the South, but of the North, of the whole nation. It will be costly to people and all the anti-war arguments. When batteries of the state of South Carolina fired on a federal installation at Fort Sumter, all bets were off. The game changed. That's essentially uh, what, what, Mr. what Mr. Lincoln said you know, that uh, said not in quite so many words, but he had been <clears throat> very reluctant to exercise federal power over the slave interest and didn't think that the Constitution gave him as the chief executive power to interfere with the institutions of the states. But once there was a domestic insurrection that he had to put down with force, 
And once he became persuaded that the slave interest in the South, slave labor after all was building the munitions in Richmond and building the fortifications in Virginia, they were an asset of the enemy. And so under wartime conditions, his view of his own, the expanse of his own powers changed and he came to the conclusion that yes, with a stroke of the pen, I can declare that all persons in, in involuntary servitude in areas in rebellion against the Union, right? He left out the border states where slavery was left untouched by the Emancipation Proclamation. All those people will be free because my job is to win the war. Now it just so happened and he said this various places, that the emancipation of slavery was also something that was, uh, of slaves was close to his heart, and he felt that this was a step in the right direction toward achieving justice. But that's not why he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, I don't believe. He signed it as a matter of military necessity. So the war changed the story for almost everybody. Wars have a way of doing that. That's a slightly garbled answer, but maybe clearer than I had hoped, <laughs> right? Hey, so I remember, you know, learning at school about like the New Deal, and I'm like, oh man, Roosevelt's New Deal, this is amazing, all these new reforms, this is awesome, until I realized how redlining was baked in and it impacted people who look like me. So like, how do we, how do you feel now about the his, history curriculums in schools, what our kids are learning? Um, I know we can all grow older and read books and, you know, learn as we kind of get older, but how, how comfortable are you with what's being taught in the school? It's a, it's a great question, and I, I could talk about it at length, which I'll try not to do. But, um, you know, the New Deal is a great example of the kind of complexity that I'm trying to evoke here. I think all Americans should be glad we had a New Deal. I think it helped to bring this country into a better place in the 20th century. It alleviated the suffering of a lot of people, uh, established precedents that, from my political point of view, are very good ones that we should build on as we look to the future. At the same time, you're completely right, and that for a long time, just as we wrote slavery out of the story of America, we wrote out of the story of the New Deal the fact that uh, African Americans were almost entirely excluded from its benefits. You know, Social Security didn't apply to domestic workers. That's a fact that we have to put front and center in our history curriculum. But I hope we can do it in such a way that we don't at the same time say, ah, Franklin Roosevelt and everybody around him were a bunch of racist hypocrites. What his personal views were is a complex issue and how much Eleanor Roosevelt was able to uh, affect him. You know, historians are still arguing about that. But the point is, it was another complicated political moment. It's not clear to me that the New Deal legislation could have been secured at all without the alliance between Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats. And the price of support of Southern Democrats was to exclude African Americans from the benefits of the New Deal. We need to face that. We need to know it. We need to understand that it's an, another aspect of American history that must be redressed. But I hope we can tell that story in a somewhat nuanced way rather than, oh, Roosevelt was a hero yesterday, now he's a villain, or the other way around. That's the best I can do with that. When people ask me, what do I do for a living? And maybe you got a feel for that today. I say, I'm in the confusion business, <laughs> you know? I find that students, and they get their attitudes, of course, from their families. Students come into class, and this goes for the most sophisticated, uh, high-powered, Ivy League-type students and uh, younger people uh, without those kinds of educational opportunities. They come into class with established attitudes about what the story is, who was right, and who was wrong. My job is to confuse them. Because <laughs> life is confusing, and you've got to be prepared for that. So. Education could help a little bit in that regard, I think. Do we have time for another one or two? As a fellow confuser, I'd like <laughs> to ask this question. Because the other day it, it hit me when they were talking about the impeachment proceedings of Nixon and having only three TV stations. Yeah. Now we have so many different 
TV stations. And, of course, in the 1850s, the Telegraph brought newspapers to the forefront. Uh, people had said at the time it was going to unite our country, but in some ways, all that information polarized us even then. So I'm wondering about your thoughts about that. Well, it's another great question that we could talk about at great length, and it's a, it's a helpful one because I think many, most of us are aware that the new technologies that have enabled social media and the dissemination of information with inconceivable speed that, you know, I could not have imagined in the 1970s and 80s, and as recently as that, that, that um, we hoped it would have a democratizing effect, that it would be, uh, you know, bring fresh air into our lives, uh, expose hidden truths, uh, make it more difficult to keep secrets, uh, and that that would be good for democracy. And in some ways, it has been good for democracy. I mean, and, and, for, and for justice. I mean, the fact that people all have little, little things in their pockets that they can take video means that law enforcement officers are likely to be a little bit more reluctant about certain kinds of behavior that might get caught on camera. And that's a good thing. But at the same time, as we all know, uh, we now have this uh, cacophony of voices out there. We have no gatekeepers who, for, who controls what goes out there, no editors. I mean, some organizations still do, but all the, the, the falsehoods, lies, exaggerations, fantasies, paranoid uh, 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 conspiracy stories that are out there and that people, if, they're, if it's on their favorite channel, they believe it. And that has tended to uh, poison the, the, the atmosphere and degrade the civic discourse. Something like those two different things were ha was happening in the 1850s, as you say, with the rise of the telegraph, the um, improved technology of newspaper production. The news could get out a lot faster to a lot more people than it had ever before. The, so that ordinary people were aware of what was going on uh, uh, 500 miles away in a way that they had never been before. That was good in some ways for the cause of fugitive slaves because it meant that it was harder to see somebody in secret and whisk them away without people knowing about it. But it's also true that the press became more and more polarized and uh, it fed the uh, antagonism on both sides of the slavery issue. So. Again, it's, as you say, we're both in the confusion business. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing, and we're going to live with it, as far as I can tell, in one form or another forever. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Today at the City Club, we've been hearing from Dr. Andrew Del Banco. He's the recipient of the 2019 Anisfield Wolf Book Award in nonfiction. He's the author of Bef The War Before the War, Fugitive Slaves, and the Struggle for America's Soul from the Revolution to the Civil War. Our forum today is the Karen Faith Witt and A.H. Weinstein Memorial Forum on the Persecution of Peoples, made possible by a generous endowment gift from Norman H. Weinstein and the friends of Karen Faith Witt. We're delighted to have Ellen Botnick, sister of Karen Faith Witt, with us today. We appreciate your continued support of City Club programming. Thank you so much. Our forum is also part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by many of you, residents of Cuyahoga County, through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to all the residents of Cuyahoga County for their support through that public grant. We welcome guests at tables uh, hosted by Case Western Reserve University, Annisfield Wolf Scholars, the Cleveland Foundation, Friends of Kozad Bates House Interpretive Center, and Lorain County Community College. Lastly, we welcome students from Citizens Leadership Academy, Flow Homeschool Co-op, and Horizon Science Academy, Cleveland High School. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from the William M. Weiss Foundation with additional support from the donors you'll find listed in today's program. We're very happy to have all of you with us today. The sale of Dr. Del Banco's book is provided by Max Bax. Thank you so much to them for joining us today. And that brings us to the end of our forum. Thank you, Dr. Del Banco. Thank you, City Club members, whose financial support makes all of this work possible. You can find out more about City Club forums and how you can support the City Club when you visit us online at cityclub.org. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.
Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.